another day, another talk. <laughs> so it's getting towards what they call the pointy end of the meditation retreat. This is when you've been here over a week and some of you look back and think, oh my goodness, nothing has happened. What a waste of time. How am I going to face my friends when I go back? Spent all this money coming here and I go back and say, what did you get? <laughs> but, remember that is still wanting going on. So, please always remember that this retreat is letting go of all wanting, letting go of the craving. If you've been shooting that arrow over to Nimitas, over to Jhanas, wanting peace, wanting something out of this retreat, of course you never find the treasure and you leave this retreat disappointed and frustrated, but even worse, embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> so, your job is to let go. You have so many opportunities for doing nothing. So for all of you who have been trying to meditate and getting absolutely nowhere, doesn't that prove something? That you're hopeless? <laughs> You can't do anything. <laughs> so look, just give up. You haven't got a chance to get jhanas of enlightenment, no chance at all, so you might as well just give up. And when you give up, that's when they come. This is the way to become enlightened. It's one of my favourite similes, which again, I invented. I invent similes. So, the thing I can you patent similes so when other monks use them I can get a cut? <laughs> I don't think you can patent similes. But this is a famous simile of the donkey and the carrot. It's actually how to become enlightened, how to get jhanas, how to get everything you ever want. Because many of you know that one of the most stubborn uh, beings in the whole of uh, the universe is a donkey. They're all, almost, but not quite as stubborn as husbands <laughs> and wives. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> They're really, really stubborn, these, these donkeys. And you can hit them and they still won't move. So that's why they have the phrase, as stubborn as a donkey. But instead of hitting donkeys with a stick, Again, you use wisdom power. You tie that stick to the donkey's neck. So the front of the stick is about two foot in front of the donkey's head. And on the end of the stick you tie a string. On the end of the string you tie a carrot. And the donkey sees as a carrot two foot in front. And because it sees as a carrot two foot in front, the donkey moves towards the carrot. And the stick moves, the string moves, and the carrot moves. So the donkey keeps going, 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 going forward, almost getting close enough to the carrot, but never, never getting there. And that's what makes the donkey pull the cart, because it sees the carrot, and it goes towards the carrot, but the carrot always moves away. Now that is a simile for your life. There has been many carrots in your life. The beautiful relationship, happiness, peace, wealth, good health. Sometimes it's almost been in reach. You can almost see it there. Satisfaction, the perfect relationship, you know, the perfect house, the perfect job, the perfect health. It's almost there and you go towards it and it moves away from you. And that's the same in meditation. Sometimes you can almost see peace there, even animity. You see it and you move towards it and it moves away from you. Oh, this is so difficult, isn't it? But, you come to places like this and you learn how to catch the carrot. Because these donkeys, you know, they sort of run around and they hang around and one day one of the donkeys was uh, behind a Buddhist temple and he heard the monk teach how to catch the carrot, which is, again, letting go. And then you catch the carrot. So how does the donkey catch the carrot? The donkey has been running after that carrot, running all its life, 
And no matter how fast it runs, the, do the carrot is always two foot in front of the donkey's head. But there's one thing the donkey hears at the Buddhist temple. He hears the magic four-letter word. Stop. Stop. So the donkey stops. Now when you stop, when you let go, when you put things down, the carrot moves further away. Just like what I've been telling you, don't control the mind. Have you noticed when you don't control the mind it goes even more crazy than usual? When you let it go, it thinks more. When you let it go, it gets more tired. When you first let go and stop, the carrot moves further away than it's been before. And that carrot moves further and further away until it's at this amazing point, four foot in front of the donkey's head. Never been that far away before. But the donkey has got confidence, faith. It doesn't move, it just stays perfectly still. And then something very strange happens, which is what happens in meditation. You've been doing absolutely nothing, <coughs> things have been going all over the place, and then the carrot starts to come towards you. For the very first time in your experience, you're sitting here and the meditation is just happening. All these states are occurring, you're doing nothing. The carrot is coming towards you. And soon that carrot is at that place it usually is, two foot in front of your mouth. But this time, it's coming at great speed. Remember it was two foot in front, it's gone all the way up because you stopped, now it's coming down and it's swinging right towards you. And all the cat, the donkey needs to do is to remember that last piece of instruction, just when the carrot is right in front of its mouth, the donkey has to say, the door of my mouth is open to you, carrot. <laughs> Come in. And that's how donkeys catch carrots. They run like hell after it, and then they stop. The carrot goes up, down, in, and then you're enlightened. <laughs> now that's a very brilliant simile, because you know that is absolutely so true, how it works. You run after enlightenment all your life, in this retreat, charging along, and we run after it, and it's two foot in front. Run faster, still two foot in front. Run slow, it's still two foot in front. You never quite catch up to it. It's in sight, you can almost reach it, but you can't. That's when we stop. We let go. You stop running. We stand perfectly still. And at first, all these states go further away from us. But, we're patient, we're confident, and it comes towards us. And they get as many carrots as you like. That's why in southern Europe, once Buddhism came to Europe, they had to stop with donkey carts. Donkeys all knew how to catch the carrots once they learned <laughs> Buddhism. That's why they had to have automobiles. <coughs> but, that's how it works and that's how you catch these carrots. And that's so many stories of people who try to meditate, they try, 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 and they get nowhere. And there's a wonderful thing called frustration. I love frustration. Frustration is a beautiful thing. Because number one, it shows you how stupid you are, and you get insight from that. I'm frustrated. Why? Because I've been doing second noble truth meditation, wanting something, therefore I get frustrated. So what happens after frustration? Ah, you give up. You let go. You stop trying it. And when you stop trying, when you let go, especially in meditation, that is when the carrot starts to do its job and come towards you. For those of you who have still got no faith, who are still really fed up, you've been meditating and meditating and meditating and meditating and meditating, you're still getting nowhere. And, you know, you don't really want to do anything else in life, you know, you've been there, done that, and most of the things in life. Remember the story of this wonderful nun, I think she was called Wajira. This nun, she'd been a bhikkhuni for seven years. And in those seven years of living in monasteries, a nice peaceful life, never once did she have a peaceful meditation. Not even once. That should make you feel a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> and after seven years, she thought, oh my goodness, I just can't meditate, I just can't do it. So it's a waste of time, me being a nun. But she said, I don't want to go back home and live that lay life. Because she said she never wanted to go back to the three crooked things. 
This was an idiom in Pali in those days. You see that in the Terigata, when a woman leaves home, she says she abandons the three crooked things. And that's a very close translation of the Pali. And the first crooked thing a woman abandons when she becomes a bhikkhuni is the, the ladle. You know, the ladle to make the curries. Because that's a crooked piece of wood. In other words, that's a symbol of cooking and kitchen work. So she lets go of the crooked ladle. In other words, the symbol of all, uh, house, uh, all uh, cooking. And the second crooked thing she abandons is the, the broom. You know, the stick with the broom, because that's a symbol of other housework. So she lets go of the first crooked thing, which is the ladle, the second crooked thing, which is the broom, and the third crooked thing is her husband. <laughs> and that's how they put it in the parley. It's really funny, when I first read that, I howled with laughter. Those are the three crooked things for a woman. You can remember that. Remember what the first one is? The ladle, the broom, and the husband. <laughs> I don't want to go back to those things again. So anyway, so she didn't want to go back to the three crooked things. And she didn't want, she couldn't stay as a nun anymore. So there's only one alternative for her. She took a length of rope and she went into the forest and she climbed a tree and she, she tied one end of the rope to one end of the tree and the other end of the rope around her neck. And she was just about to jump off. When? She was free, she had liberation, she became enlightened. Now that's another way of getting enlightened, but it's not encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> it's, sometimes you wonder why, why did that happen? And the reason was because at that time she actually really stopped trying, she gave up, she let go. And in that moment of letting go, letting go of concern for her body, letting go of everything. At that moment, she understood what meditation was. The carrot came towards her. She stopped and it came into her mouth. She became enlightened. So that's actually how it worked. It reminds me of that other story, which I'm sure you've heard many times, about that guy in Perth who was an artist. I don't know if you read about that. He was like quite a, a, a well-known artist and he had a motorbike accident. And in the accident, it crushed his hand, so he had to have it amputated. And apparently, as soon as he was out of hospital, this was the hand he painted with, this was his passion, his life. So he thought, without painting, what's the point? So he wanted to commit suicide as well. So he went into one of these big office blocks on St. George's Terrace, the CBD in Perth, climbed up to a high story, got out on a ledge, and was just about to jump off when he saw something below which changed his whole attitude. He saw a man with absolutely no arms at all, dancing down the street for joy. No arms, and dancing for joy. And he thought, my goodness, here's me, I've only lost one hand, and that guy's got no hands, no arms, and look how happy he is. And he realized there was not much point in committing suicide. He turned around, he went out to the, to the elevators, the lifts, because he wanted to thank that guy. And he got down as soon as he could and ran after that guy. It was easy to spot, you know, not that many people with no arms. He found the guy, gave him a big hug and said, look, thank you so much, you've just saved my life. I was about to jump off because I've lost a hand. I was so depressed because I can't do anything now. And there you, you've got no hands at all and you're dancing up and down for joy. Why? Now the homeless man said, look, I'm not jumping up and down for joy, dancing for joy, I'm just trying to scratch my bum. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> it's, it's, it's totally sick. <laughs> How else, if you've got no arms, could you scratch your itchy bum? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so you see, that's really what we mean about letting go of things and not holding on to things. And that is how you get deep meditation. And that's also how you get enlightened. So the, 
the measure of your enlightenment is not how many attainments you have, but how little you have. How much you've let go of, how much you've abandoned. That's also why even these deep meditations, I call them not attainments, but stages of letting go. Just to see how much you can abandon of control, of ownership. See how few things you can have in your mind, not how many things. But sometimes we just keep too much in our mind. Too many memories, too many plans, too many fantasies, which means we can't enjoy this moment. Now I was born in London and coming to Australia, I think it was about seven years in Australia before I went to visit my mother in England. And when I was going there, the people said, oh, why didn't you bring your mother a present, something from Australia to remember you? And of course what they got was a little kangaroo, you know, these little fluffy toy kangaroos. So I took that home to my mother and she was so happy with this, this little stuffed kangaroo. She put it on this shelf in the lounge room in pride of place because, you know, it was a nice little toy and it reminded her of her son a long way away. And the next time I came, I, you know, she already had a kangaroo, so I got her a little koala. You know, you, know, you can get them in the airport shops, little koala bears. And she liked that too, so she put it next to the, uh, the kangaroo. And the next time I came, I managed to get a kookaburra. And after a kookaburra, it was a platypus. And after a platypus, it was a, a wombat. Now by this time, that shelf was so full, all he had the kangaroo, the koala, the kookaburra, and the, what's the other one? Wombat. No, the wombat was a new one. The platypus. <laughs> that when she got the wombat, she tried to put it on the shelf and all the other ones fell off. The shelf wasn't big enough. And she spent half an hour trying to balance all these animals on the shelf. And that's when I told her, I said, but why don't you actually throw the other ones away and just have the new one? And that way, the, you know, the new one can take pride of place. So the other ones, they've been there long enough, you can give them away. Oh no, <laughs> they're so nice. And I want to keep them, they remind me of happy things. And then I realized that just that's the way that people's minds work. They've got so many stuff in their mind. They try and put one more thing in there and it all falls off. It's called a mental breakdown. You've got too much stuff inside. So, in meditation we learn how to let things go, to sweep the shelf clean. All the stuff in the past, yeah, it's been there, it's done its job. All the stuff in the future, you don't know what's going to happen, so keep it all clear. And the only thing you have on the shelf in your mind is what's happening now. Keep it simple, keep it peaceful. Then if you've just got one little kangaroo or one little kookaburra or wombat there, then it's got plenty of space and it's beautiful and you can appreciate it. How can you appreciate or understand anything when it's so complicated with so many other things? Over in our monasteries in Thailand, because they were in jungle and because there were so many dangerous animals in those jungles, they were always thinking of eating you. For them, you were their lunch and their dinner. So we had to sweep the paths in the jungle to keep them free of leaves and twigs so we could see if there was any snake or centipede or scorpion actually on the path so we could avoid them. So that was our main job in those monasteries, to keep the paths clean so they were safe to walk along. Can you imagine if there was too many twigs and leaves, you don't know what's underneath the leaf, you don't know if a, if a twig was a, a snake. I got many, many snake stories from, from those time in Thailand. One of my favorite stories was of meditating all night, because we used to do that once a week. And in the early morning, you know, when you sort of, uh, after meditating all night, you, know, you go out to urinate. And this was in the jungle, so you don't urinate in the toilets, you just urinate in the bush. You know, the Asian style, you know, you squat down, and urinate. So number one, you know, I've been meditating all night, so I was a bit tired. And it was dawn, so the light wasn't very strong. And so when I squatted down to urinate, I now really did think I was urinating on a stick until the stick started to move. <laughs> and I realized I was peeing on a snake. 
Now, only the men can really appreciate this, women can't really understand, because the most sensitive part of your body was only a couple of inches from that venomous snake's mouth. <laughs> that was scary. <laughs> so there I was urinating on a snake, you know, with very unprotected. And that snake didn't bite me. Not at all. It just wiggled away quite happily. And afterwards I started thinking, why? Why did that happen? And I realized that this was a monastery. I was a monk. And that snake must have imagined it was being blessed with holy water. <laughs> you can't get holier water <laughs> than from the bladder <laughs> of a monk. So it's all right, even the nuns over there, you can urinate on snakes, they probably think it's a great blessing. <laughs> if you're going to try it on a tiger snake. <laughs> but anyway, you urinate on snakes, you step on snakes, they crawl up you or whatever. But of course they, they never bite you. But in the past, we have to keep the past clean. So, you know, we don't sort of uh, ask for too much trouble. And when you, like, I was a Westerner. And we, we Westerners are really perfectionists. We just don't know how to let go and enjoy life. It has to be perfect first. So every time you were sweeping the path, you know, you'd look back and one leaf would fall down. And you'd go back to sweep it up. And then when you're sweeping that leaf over there, another leaf over there would fall down. So they're always going back and forth, trying to make the path perfect. It's absolutely stupid, because the leaves will fall down all the time. Half an hour, an hour later, there'll always be leaves on the path you just swept, that's just the nature of it. But when Ajahn Chah saw that, he said, you know, you Westerners are really weird. But he said, why do you do that? He said, because when one leaf falls down on a cleanly swept path, it really stands out. You can see it very clearly. But when one leaf falls in the jungle floor, when there are so many other leaves and twigs there. It's just so caught up and complicated and connected with everything else, you just can't see it. He said, that's just like insight, understanding life. Sometimes there's so many leaves in our mind, we can't understand any one of them. But if we've got a very clean, clear, empty mind, one leaf, one thought, one emotion, one idea comes up, and it stands separated from all the other ideas and thoughts and experiences, just like one leaf on a cleanly swept path. We can see it, understand it, make sense of it, simply because the path is clear of everything else. One little wombat on an empty shelf, you can appreciate it. When there's a wombat and a kangaroo and so much other stuff on there, it's just too complicated, we can't understand or appreciate anything. Which is why simplicity is not just a recipe for joy in life. Simplicity is also the path of, of insight, of understanding. To try and keep it simple, one little thing at a time. One idea which arises in an empty mind, you can understand very well. Many ideas in a complicated mind it's just too confusing. That's why letting go, simplicity, emptiness, that is actually where wisdom comes from. Otherwise it's just too complicated. So here we're trying to make life as simple as possible, trying to keep our mind as empty as possible, as free as possible. I know in the world people think, oh that's just being dumb and stupid. You know, you've got an empty mind, means you're a sort of a stupid guy, but Stupidity is sometimes very close to enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> because this, again, this is one of the other stories which comes up about you know, what enlightenment is or the way to become enlightened. This is the story, this is one of my favorite monks. I forgot his name, but this, I remember the story about this when I was a young monk. Where, you know, in the northeast of Thailand in those days, they only used to have four years of school, that's all just basic education. So this guy, when he came to about five or six years of age, got into grade one of the local village school. Now grade one, I mean, you can sometimes remember what grade one is like. After 12 months of being in grade one, this kid failed. There's no way the teacher could put him into grade two. 
Now, I don't know how you can fail grade one. I mean, that is really a big achievement. <laughs> but there's no way that she could pass him. So he, when all of his friends went forward into grade two, he had to stay behind and join the new intake in grade one. After another 12 months, still his teacher could not advance him. You know, he was really that stupid. And after three years in grade one, they gave up. So they, he had to leave school. He just could not learn. So imagine that, three years, grade one, and he still can't pass. So what, did, what happened next? They thought he was so stupid that he would never be able to even pull the plow or do farming. So they sent him to the only place where such stupid people could be sent, and that was a local Buddhist monastery. <laughs> <laughs> so they sent him to the village monastery there, and the abbot there was very kind and incredibly patient. So he tried to teach him the, the chanting. You know, just simple chanting, he just couldn't get. You know, even Namo Tassa, and that was the second word. <laughs> and after a couple of years of that, even the most patient of abbots just couldn't sort of uh, do anything else with him. So they put him to the place of last resort which was the forest monasteries where I come from. Because there they don't do much study or chanting, it's just meditation. And when he went to one of these forest monasteries, the teacher there just gave him a very simple meditation technique. You just watch your breath. And his mind was so simple and clear, he could watch his breath all day without any problem at all. He soon got these great achievements in meditation, jhanas, soon became totally enlightened with some psychic powers as well and became one of the great arahats. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful story? So the trouble with you guys is you're far too intelligent. <laughs> you know, it's a shame, isn't it? Because sometimes, you know, at school you can remember that time. You know, maybe you were in grade one or grade two and the teacher said, what do you think of that? And you said, nothing and you got scolded for it. Stupid! You could have been a great meditator, another person who was enlightened, and your teacher made you think and spoiled everything. <laughs> His mind was just so clear. That's why he could meditate so deeply. And that's what we're talking about, having a very free and empty mind. So clear, so peaceful. There's nothing between you and the breath or whatever other object you have. So keep it simple, see if you can let go as much as you possibly can. And as far as all the reading is concerned, I'm in very big trouble because I remember this Zen monk who came to visit uh, England. And this was when I was a lay person. In those days, because I was a Buddhist, a lay person, I'd just go to any talk on Buddhism. I didn't care what sort of sex it was, I was so desperate for anything to do with Buddhism. And so that when, when he came, I remember him, we asked him at first, when he first came to give a talk in London, he could hardly speak any, any English. But when he came back after touring around England, somebody asked him this question. It was translated, but by this time he picked up a lot of English. And the question was what he thought of Buddhism in England at that time, it's about 40 years ago. And he gave this beautiful, eloquent answer what he thought of Buddhism in England. He said, books, 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 too many, too many, too many, dustbin, dustbin, dustbin. <laughs> <laughs> That's very eloquent, we all laugh, I'll never forget that. Because it's true, sometimes we've got so many ideas, but we understand too little. And why is that? Because instead of experiencing life, we think about it too much. How much information do you really need to become enlightened? You have so much information these days. In the time of the Buddha, just one teaching, and the people go off and become enlightened. Now you've got the whole teachings of the Buddha, you know, in this little um, USB stick, or in your sort of iPhone or whatever. You've got it all there, and still you're not enlightened. What's going on? It's because we don't know how to stop. We're always going on for more information, more thinking, 
more trying to understand things with thought rather than experiencing things. But in meditation, experience silence. Don't think about it. Keep very few instructions. One thing at a time. Not too many. So a few people I've given that simile during the the interviews. What did I give that in the I think I did a question answer about the taxi driver, about giving instructions. Because that's why think of your poor mind, you're always giving instructions when you're meditating. Come on, watch your breath. No, don't watch your breath, you're supposed to let go. Now if you just let go, you just get very st stupid. When you're thinking, you've got to stop thinking. <laughs> and sometimes it gets so complicated, you keep thinking too much and experiencing too little. So sometimes we just stop and experience. That's one of the reasons why, for those people who are thinking too much, you just go out into the bush and listen. Listen to the sound of the birds, because when you listen to the sound of the birds, you can't be thinking about the sound. You know, you feel, you feel the, take your shoes off and just feel the texture of the ground on your feet. Feel the wind on your face. Go out when it's raining, if it does rain, and feel the rain on you. So see if you get to experience life rather than thinking about it. What you're doing there is actually calming that part of the mind which causes all the problems. The thinking, thinking, thinking. What are the reasons why people can't clean the mind up of thinking? Why they, my mother couldn't throw away all those nice little toys? It's because, because she thought they were really important. And it's what you give importance to is what stays in your mind. If you really value the thinking, then you will think a lot. If the past is important to you, you have the idea that if you keep dwelling on the past, you'll solve your problems, then the past will keep coming up. If you're so anxious about the future, you really believe that if you don't think about the future, it's all going to go wrong, then the future keeps coming up. Whatever you give value to is what occupies your mind. Which is why to be able to clean up, to clean up sort of all this stuff in the mind and keep it reasonably empty so you can get wisdom and peace, you've got to take away the value of all these mental possessions which you have. All this stuff which you put on the mantle shelf of your mind. Clean that up. You can only do that when you see it's not valuable, it's not important. And the emptiness and peace is far more important. Well, that's why I keep saying you know, all the stuff in the past. I gave another simile of the past about the photograph album. You know, do you have photograph albums at home? Sometimes you p just keep them on the computer these days, but you know, it's still like an album. There's collections of photographs which you have. And I've been to people's houses, I've seen the photographs on the wall, and you see the photographs of you know, their, their wedding, that's a common one, or their graduation, you know, when they just finished university and somebody gave them the, the scroll. You've got the photos of them on holiday, you've got the photos of them with their children. You've seen all those photographs of happy moments, but I've been to people's houses, never once have I seen a photograph of their divorce. <laughs> <laughs> Here's me at the lawyer's office. <laughs> <laughs> Never once have I seen a person with a photograph of them in hospital. I've never seen a person, a photograph of them doing their homework. <laughs> it's always the happy moments which we photograph and keep. Why is that? And the reason is because that brings you happiness and joy. Uplifts you and brings up those happy memories which are very helpful. Unfortunately, we have another photograph album and that's the one between our ears. And that keeps too many of the unpleasant photographs of our life. And sometimes those unpleasant photographs, the time you know, when you had the argument, the time when you're very sick, the time when someone abused you, was very cruel to you, all those photographs we keep between our ears. You know why we keep them there? Because we feel they're important. That's all. 
There is no reason why we can't throw them all away where they belong. Why can't we let them go? The same reason why my mother couldn't let go of those other little animals on the shelf. Oh no, they're important. You know, once I, I gave a talk at a grief and loss conference in Scarborough, and I gave a really nice little presentation on how to let go of grief. And there's some very powerful Buddhist ways of letting go of grief, which actually work. But after I gave my presentation, this woman came up to me and she was very angry at me. She scolded me. How dare you take away my grief, she said. And that really shocked me. There was a great insight into me. She didn't want to let go of her grief. She was one of these women who was going around every grief and loss conference in Australia and probably internationally as well. She was Mrs. Grief. She had some terrible, um, literally, she had some terrible tragedy in her life. I think her daughter had been murdered or something. And she didn't want to let go of her grief and move on in life. That was who she was. Now do you understand why it's hard to let go? Sometimes we value these things so much, they become who we are. We got so used to them that moving away is literally going into uncharted territory, beyond our comfort zone. We've been comfort. We've, we've become used to our psychosis. We've become used to our pain. And that's why it's so hard to let it go. It's exactly the same thing that when a person has been in prison for so many years, and now they have parole. They just don't want to leave. They don't want to leave because they're not used to life outside. Even though it's far more pleasant and huge amounts of freedom, they're not used to it, so they'd rather stay in the pain they're used to. It's important for them. That's how hard it is to let go sometimes. But how do we let go of that? We let go of that to convince ourselves it's more valuable to be free outside of jail than to stay with the pain of our past. It's more valuable to be free. Because whatever you give value to, that is what will grow in you. To be peaceful. Look, even just to forgive. I just have to work really, really hard on teaching people in the Western world about how to forgive. Because still, some people come up and say, yeah, I can see you can forgive some people, but some people you just cannot forgive. They don't deserve forgiveness. And when I hear that, my heart sinks. Because as far as I'm concerned, there's not any person in the world you can't forgive. Why? It's because that is the way forward. That is the way of freedom. That is the way of stopping future pain and misery and cruelty in the world. Punishing, as many people know, just hides the problem and just makes the problem reoccur. Forgiveness deals with it. Because what we mean by forgiveness? Number one, it's honesty. Often notice this, but even yourself. You know, are you really honest with your meditation, honest with yourself, really truthful? A lot of you aren't, you know why? It's because if we're really truthful with our meditation, we think that we're going to feel bad. <laughs> it's amazing just how, how many people just bend the truth because they're fear, afraid of being scolded. Scolded by other people or scolded by yourself. That's one of the reasons why people aren't truthful. Because we're afraid to be truthful. We're afraid that there'll be some unpleasant consequences as a, as a result. Which is one of the reasons why forgiveness encourages truth. In other words, there's going to be no punishment. So you can tell the truth. It's one of the reasons why every one of you who's come to interviews, I've never scolded anybody, not once. Even though many times you, you deserve to be scolded. <laughs> You don't scold. You know why you don't scold people? If I scolded people, if I was a really first teacher and say, "You're stupid. You should be getting up early in the morning. You know, you should be sort of not talking and using those phones. You shouldn't be, be uh, sneaking food in your room." If you were 
very, very fierce like that and scolded people, they still do the same, only they'd hide it more effectively. <laughs> All that such scolding p does is makes people afraid, so they become more skillful in denial and hiding the truth. Which is one of the reasons why when there's forgiveness and compassion, then people feel they can confess, they can say what happened, they can bring it up, because they're not afraid. Someone's going to say, yes, I forgive you, I understand, you made a mistake, I make mistakes. Well done, bring it up, accept it. And then once there is no fear, because forgiveness, amnesty if you like, is automatic, people will actually say their problems, they won't feel so bad about them, and there's a way of dealing with them. We can face them and find strategies so that it doesn't happen in the future. One of those stories is of the Anagarika. Anagarika is these people in white, you know, you see them in the monastery, or the, uh, the nun in white, that's an Anagarika. They're in training to be nuns. And in training to be nuns, they too have to keep precepts like you do. They cannot eat in the afternoon. And I was uh, over the monastery, over the road one day, and this Anagarika, this was quite a few years ago now, he came up to me and he said he, he, he didn't sleep well the night before. And the reason was he broke one of his precepts. He was really, really scared when he came up to tell me that the afternoon before he felt very hungry and he got into the kitchen and made himself a sandwich without anybody knowing. He'd broken his rule. He'd stolen food from the kitchen and eaten a sandwich. And he said, I feel so bad. I never slept last night. I feel terrible. I had to come and confess it to you. And I, Buddhist monk, I know just how the Buddha taught. And I said, very well done. You've confessed uh, a mistake. Wonderful. Now you're forgiven. Now, how can we make sure you don't do that again? Number one, eat more at lunchtime. Stuff yourself a bit more so you don't feel hungry in the evening. <laughs> and if you are hungry in the evening, you can have cheese, you can have chocolate, you can have honey. There's all this stuff you can have so you don't really need to go and make yourself a sandwich. He said, oh, I can do that. He said, yeah, of course you can. And he said, but aren't you going to punish me? He said, no, no, we don't do punishments in Buddhist monasteries. And he said, but you have to. He said, what do you mean? <laughs> and he said, if you don't punish me, he said, I'll do the same again, because that's what I'm like. So he put me in this terrible situation. He demanded some sort of penance. So I had to think very quickly what to do. And as it happened, that very morning, I had been reading a book of Australian history. Some of you may have read the book, it's quite a famous book, The Fatal Shore. Uh, who is it by this very famous, uh, uh, one of the very famous uh, historians, Australian historians. But it was about a story of the, the convicts who came over from England and how they were treated. And you know, one of the things which happened to them, you know, when they made a mistake, they were flogged. And the British used this, this type of whip called the cat of nine towers. It was a vicious thing. But that's what they used to do to these prisoners. And because I'd just been, Robert Hughes, Robert Hughes, Fatal Shore. And because I'd just been reading that, and it was fresh in my mind, I told this Australian Anagarika in training to be a monk, I said, well, if you want a punishment, I've got a traditional Australian punishment for you. I will give you 50 strokes of the cat. And this... <laughs> <laughs> And <laughs> this poor Anagarika, you know, his face went whiter than the clothes he was wearing. <laughs> you know, his jaw started to tremble, because he hadn't expected that. He thought, oh my God, in Buddhist monasteries they whip you if you have a sandwich in the, <laughs> a sandwich in the afternoon. <laughs> and he was really scared. <laughs> and then I told him what 50 strokes of the cat means in a Buddhist monastery. At that time, we had two cats. Find one of them and stroke it. One, <laughs> two, three. 
that became the punishment of 50 strokes of the cat. <laughs> and about one year ago, <laughs> someone one of these retreats, they came up to me in interview times, they said they'd done something wrong. I think they just got themselves a sandwich in the afternoon when Bianca wasn't watching or something. <laughs> I told them the same story. But I said, here we haven't got a cat. We've got a rabbit. So I'll give you 50 strokes of the rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to get the rabbit and stroke it. One, <laughs> two, now don't do it properly. Two, two full strokes, three. Because <laughs> the purpose of that was to learn some forgiveness through compassion. That's why we can let these things go. Out of kindness. If you haven't got enough compassion, the woman will never be able to let go of that grief. Without compassion, you'll never walk out of the prison cell into freedom. Without kindness, you still keep those bad photos from the past. You know why? Because you don't like yourself or love yourself, respect yourself enough to give yourself freedom. So it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to let go. And one of the ways to let go is to realize you deserve to let go. You deserve to be free. You don't have to keep all those rotten photos. You don't have to keep so much stuff in your life. You can be free. You literally, as a gift of love, give yourself the gift of freedom. You know, it's very hard to give yourself love. So, I will now teach you a very simple metta meditation, which you probably haven't heard before, because it's a long time since I taught this. What you do in this very simple form of metta meditation, sometime during today, you sit down, get yourself nice and comfortable, you know, maybe just relax with a you know, present moment awareness and silence for a few minutes, and then you do some visualization. And what you visualize is this, you close your eyes, and you visualize that you've found an old shoebox, an old shoebox somewhere. And you think, I know what, I'm going to give me a present. So you take that shoebox, and inside that shoebox, you decide to put in, say, some, some compassion. You put compassion into the box. Imagine yourself putting compassion into this box. Then you imagine closing the lid of the old shoebox. And then you visualize yourself finding some beautiful wrapping paper, you know, with flowers or bells on it or something. There is lots of beautiful colors. And very carefully, you imagine yourself wrapping the old shoebox containing the gift with this wonderful wrapping paper, getting some, um, some tape to tape it down. And then you find one of these little gift cards. And on the gift card, you write very carefully, to me, with love, from me. <laughs> and then you put the card on top of the box. And then you imagine yourself pushing the box away and imagining yourself forgetting it. And a few seconds later, you see that box. Oh, it's a present. I wonder who it's for. <laughs> And there's a little card on it. So you open up the card. Oh, it's to me, with love for me. Oh, isn't that sweet? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what's inside. <laughs> and very carefully, don't rip it apart. Very carefully, you take off the wrapping paper with the excitement which you normally would have with a present. And you take off the wrapping paper and you open the shoebox. Ah, compassion. To me, with love for me. How did I know I needed that? <laughs> and that is a very effective way of giving yourself these beautiful gifts of freedom. And in that box, you can put all sorts of different things from time to time. You can give, say, forgiveness. You put forgiveness into the box. You don't need to sort of visualize what forgiveness is. Just however you imagine it, just put forgiveness in the box. The same technique, wrapping it up, <laughs> tying it in a nice little bow, a little card on there to me with love from me. Put it aside, 
have it come back again, open it up very slowly, be surprised, <laughs> and when you open the thing up, forgiveness. Oh, that's you know, what I really, really needed. How did you know that I needed that? Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Because it's so hard to give yourself forgiveness. It's so hard to give yourself compassion. It's so hard to give yourself peace. So we need to do that stupid ceremony <laughs> in order to make it work. So you do that and it means you can let go of these things. So when you actually do let go of these things, the mind becomes so peaceful, so free. So that is the whole purpose of this meditation. Unfortunately, some people, they still don't get it. And so instead of having a nice free and empty mind, they put jhana in, stream winning in, so much other stuff, just like that mantle shelf. You've got the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana. By the time you've got the third jhana, you can't put the fourth jhana on because there's no more space in there. Remember, attainments block the mind. It's what you think of attainments. It's just so many leaves on the path, you can't see what's there right now. So never actually look in terms of attainments and where are you on the path and how many sort of jhanas and limiters have you got so far in your life. You will notice that all the monks and the nuns, we don't have little stripes on our shoulders to show how far we've got. We don't have little stars. You know, it means once you get the first jhana, you get the first jhana middle, then the second jhana middle, then the third jhana middle, then the fourth jhana middle. And you get a special cap if you're a stream winner. <laughs> People have uniforms like that in many parts of the world and many parts of life, but we don't do uniforms in Buddhism, it's just simple robes which have nothing on them. So that we disappear. That's one of the reasons why we shave our hair, so we all look the same. Why we have the same robes, so we all look the same. So there's no sort of distinctions, so we can vanish and disappear. So that's actually how we meditate as well. The letting go, stopping, emptying out, freeing. And if you can do that, you understand what this meditation is about. So if you come, so I started off this talk, if you go home and people say, well what did you get? <laughs> I didn't get anything, but I lost a lot. <laughs> <laughs> then you should be, yeah, well done. Because that's what you're here for. You're not here to get more things to carry home with you. You're here to let go of all your shit. Shit stops here. <laughs> Pain stops here. Let it go here. And then you can go home without any of that stuff. Totally free, light, enlightened, carrying fewer burdens in life. If you understand that, you understand what meditation is for freedom. Can you actually feel what freedom is? It's one of those great words, I mentioned earlier what freedom is, the freedom from desire, not the freedom of desire. Have you ever notice that when you want, 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 want? Do you ever feel free? Do you ever feel this great space around you when you don't want very much? Or, oh sorry, when you want a lot of things. You know, when you want a lot of things, life is just so complicated, it's like a burden, things are, cramping in on you, when you've got to get this, you've got to get that, you've got to work hard to get this money to buy that. Oh, it's just such a pressure on you. When you don't want anything, then you feel just so expansive, so free. That's why freedom, real freedom, is contentment. When you're happy to have what you've already got, you don't need anything more. How much more do you need? If you did have a wish now, and I could grant you that wish, just like the magic duck last night. <laughs> what would you want? Now that did happen to me once. This is my last little story. But it's coming on to the end of the retreat now, and sometimes at the end of the retreat, people say, you know, they express their gratitude. You know, the way we usually express gratitude, we ask, is there anything you want? You know, you've been a great teacher, can, you, can I get something for you? I don't mean for John, a great brother of monastery, it's just for you, Ajahn Brahm. Something you want personally, because you know, really help me. I know the monastery and Jhana Grove needs funds, but for you. Now as a monk, I'm not allowed to have any money. No personal funds, no credit cards, no bank accounts, no gold bars, 
No secret slush funds in Swiss bank accounts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any of that. But there is a loophole in the Vinaya. And that's Vinaya's a monk's rule. The loophole is actually called the Mendica Allows. That's what it's called. And what that is, is somebody can say, I cannot give you money, but what do you need? What do you want? And they usually say the amount, say for a hundred dollars. I want to give a donation of a hundred dollars to you, but I know I can't give you the money, so what do you want? What can I get you for about a hundred bucks? That is allowable. But please, don't do that. <laughs> The reason is because many, many years ago when I was in Thailand, I helped somebody. I did a really good service for them and that's what they did to me. They knew what the, the rules were. They were in Thailand. They came up to me and said, Ajahn Brahm, you really, really, really helped me and I want to give you something. So what can I get you for 100 baht, Thai baht? That was a long time ago. It was worth a lot of money in those days. 100 baht. You know, I couldn't think what I wanted. So my mind went blank. And this was you know, a lay person, they had a job to go to, and so they started getting very restless, and I couldn't think of what I wanted. And so I got this idea, I said, look, let me think about this, you come back tomorrow and I'll give you a list. And he thought, oh, good idea. So he went back, and I went back to my room, and I started thinking, what do I need for 100 baht? And straight away when I started thinking about this, I was actually writing it, I remember this, I was writing it down, on the wrapping paper of a mosquito coil, because I didn't have any paper. So I thought, okay, yeah, that's one thing which I needed. I needed, say, a little exercise book. That's not you know, only a couple of baht. So I needed an exercise book. But then actually the pen wasn't working properly, so I needed a you know, proper biro pen. Nothing expensive, just an ordinary biro pen. And I was writing this all down by, by candlelight. You know, that's really bad for your eyes. And then they had these little oil lamps, and so the next thing I wrote down was an oil lamp. And talking about lights, my flashlight was really gone, it was done. I needed a flashlight too and some batteries, so I wrote flashlight and batteries and so I could write with them. When I was thinking of writing, I was thinking of, actually I needed to write some letters to my family back home, so I needed some aerograms. And then I started looking and actually all that totaled up more than 100 baht. And that's all I had. And you know, once I wrote it down, I couldn't take anything off. Now I realise actually, I don't know how I lived without those things before. And as I was thinking what I could take off, I started thinking of some more things. I needed some sandals, because the sandals were, very, they were really broke. And yeah, you, you're walking in the forest, you know, with snakes around, you have some proper sandals. And actually talking about walking in the forest, you know, there was so much rain in the monsoon, I needed an umbrella. My umbrella was, had so many holes in it, you know, you might as well just not have an umbrella. There's more rain coming through than there was going outside. And I realised that list started getting longer and longer. And I was unable to scratch anything off that list. Soon 1,000 baht was reached, 10,000 baht. <laughs> and I realised what was going on. And I just threw that piece of paper in the, the spittoon. I scrunched it up and threw it in. When that man came back the next day, I said, don't you ever, ever do that to me again. I was such a happy monk, so content before you give me the option to think what I wanted. And as soon as you gave me the option to think what I wanted, my desires just exploded. 100 baht, 1,000 baht, 10,000 baht was not enough. Do you understand what I mean? If you win the lotto this week, 10 million dollars, you think that's enough? It won't be. Every person who wins a lottery always buys another lottery ticket next week. They do, it's well known. Why the heck do they do that? Because 10 million is not enough. 10 billion is not enough. Ask Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, they're still working like, like little dogs. So, freedom from desire. It's only you can never get enough, but you can always be content, no matter what you have. And this is actually hopefully what you've experienced in this retreat. We haven't got a shop here where you can buy extra food in the evening. You haven't got a shop where you can actually you know, buy a bigger cushion. There's no, no shops in this, this joint, isn't it beautiful? So money has no purpose in this place. There's no f desires which you can have except for meditation success. 
But hopefully all of your desires haven't gone into getting jhanas and getting enlightened and all that other stuff. Keep it free, keep it peaceful, keep it empty. To develop this wonderful freedom from desires, you're just content. Just happy to be here, no matter what you have. Happy to have the food which is going to be on offer today. Happy to have the old recycled jokes once again. <laughs> happy, <laughs> happy to have this old stupid mind. Just happy to be here. Not having many things. And valuing instead this beautiful sense of freedom from desires. Not valuing the desires. Valuing freedom. Real freedom. So when you understand what freedom is, once you get the insight into freedom, the empty shelf, just happy with what you've got, this is good enough. That is what freedom means. If you understand that much from this retreat, you are that close to enlightenment. If you still want more, you're just thousand light years away from enlightenment. Being content, being happy with whatever you've got. That is the trick. So that is a talk today about enlightenment. I've given you everything you ever need to know. So if you understand that, then you're very close. Shall I carry on talking for a bit more? <laughs> trick question. <laughs> no, I jump wrong. That is good enough. <laughs> Okay, so anyone's got any questions, put them on a piece of paper and uh, I'll screw them up tonight just by the other piece of paper and throw <laughs> <laughs> away. So no, so have a nice morning and don't ever think today that this is Saturday, only one more day to go. The future is uncertain. Who knows, we may decide to extend the retreat <laughs> for another week. <laughs> it, it does happen, you know. And so there may be sort of, you know, some problem in Perth airport and you can't fly home anyway. There may be some bushfire down the bottom of the road so we can't sort of get out of here. So who knows, you may still be here this time next week. <laughs> In other words, please live in the present moment and stop you know, planning the future all the time. You don't know what's going to happen next. So anyway, we got, even if it does end tomorrow afternoon, that's, that's about 30 hours from now. And 30 hours is 1,800 minutes. And 1,800 minutes is 1,080,000 seconds. That's... Is it roughly right? Anyway, there it bounced. <laughs> That's a lot of seconds. And any one of those seconds, you can get totally enlightened. Imagine that, one million and eighty thousand opportunities to become enlightened. Heaps of time. So don't rush, take it easy. One million seconds to go. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, off you go and have a nice time. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Very good. <laughs>